very nice position because it gives you a lot of vision worldwide. It gives you a lot of vision of the business as a whole of the company. Since you see all the zone, you can actually compare the markets. You can uh, compare what has been done in each of them, what works, what doesn't. The numbers are there to support you, but they're not the key thing. The product is the key thing. Like everything you do is regarding the product and the numbers they show you because you cannot just say, oh yeah, this is very good. Like you have to see if it sells to see if it's good or not. Welcome to or welcome back to Fashion Carry Stories. My name is Lucas Silva Edwards. I am a carry strategist and executive coach with more than 10 years of experience in the fashion and luxury industry here in Paris, France. My role is to help you design a successful life and career in one of the most glamorous industries on the planet, but also one of the most competitive. For that reason, I have interviewed fashion professionals at different stages of their career in order to decode the best strategies, practice and strategies. My hope for you is that you will find in this conversation some inspiration and insight that will help you build your professional journey in the world of fashion and luxury. My conversation today is with Isabella Aparicio, worldwide retail merchandiser at Celine. I'm very pleased to release this episode because, in my opinion, the role of retail merchandising is one of the lesser known, despite the fact that it sits at the heart of the business of fashion. As you will see, Isabella, despite her young age, is a mature professional with a strong track record managing high volumes of data and number. What makes her story so interesting is that she didn't start her career in fashion but in finance. So for those of you listening and are wondering how to switch into fashion or luxury, this episode will give you a few tips. For the others who are more interested in understanding what do you do as a retail merchandiser, Isabella is going to be your guide. She will go wide and deep on the reality of the job and how you can learn to turn numbers into insights. Personally, what I've loved in this conversation with Isabella is her passion to understand the needs and wishes of the customer wherever they are in the world. Fashion and luxury are based on creativity, but data and numbers are the grammar of the creative storytelling. Without them, there is no business, which is, for the best or the worst, what makes everything possible. And with no further ado, please enjoy this wide-ranging conversation with Isabella Aparicio. Psst. If you enjoyed this episode and want to support the podcast, please subscribe and leave a review. This is the most efficient way to help us grow and entice people to listen to the show. Don't be shy. Hit those five stars and show us your love in the comment section. Hi, Isabella. How, how are you? Hi, Lucas. I'm fine. And you? Good, thank you. Thank you a lot for, for coming to the to the podcast. I'm really uh, it's excited to to talk with, with you today. I know you you have been uh, working currently at, at Celine, and you have a, a, a lot of uh, interrogations about the, the next step in your in in your career, especially here in Paris or maybe in uh, in, in New York. So it's going to be a really exciting uh, uh, interview. And but before we get into all of, all of that, um, I would like to have the opportunity to understand a little bit more about your your journey and your different uh, step that has led you to work uh, or at least to intern in such a, a famous house. Can you, uh, to start, tell me a little bit, uh, when did you decide to work in fashion and where this passion for fashion uh, come from? Of course, uh, so I am half Portuguese, half Brazilian, and uh, I grew up in Rio in Brazil. And uh, I've always liked fashion since a very early age. Like I always went to all the fashion weeks in Brazil. Uh, I read fashion publications. I had a Tumblr, of course, growing up. So it was always a big part of my life. Um, however, growing up in Brazil, fashion is not a very pulsing industry. And I had to choose something more Cartesian, I can say, as a career. And therefore, I started studying economics. Uh, which I graduated and finally I worked for two and a half years in the financial market and investment banking. 
pandemic came and uh, like you just couldn't move worldwide. But in the end, I've always wanted to go back to fashion and actually do it professionally, not just as a side passion. So that's how I decided to move to France after the pandemic had calmed down a bit and uh, go to EFM to study fashion and luxury management as my MSc. Uh, I chose management in the end because I thought it was somehow related to what I had studied before. In economics, you don't have that much of business, but working in finance, I have had a lot of analysis. And by then, I was already interested in merchandising. Uh, I had done several online courses, one in person as well, uh, a bit before. And uh, that has made me realize that merchandising was very interesting, was very much aligned with what I liked. That was a very strong product part with a strong analytical part that I was training a lot <laughs> working in finance. So it was nice to go to EFM with kind of a uh, sad minded and uh, knowing what I wanted to do. And it was great that I had all the support at EFM to proceed with this career. So now I'm working in merchandising and to retail merch, women's wear and shoes at Celine. And uh, wow, I'm very happy. It's really much what I expected. And I really like my job, my missions and everything. Awesome. It sounds like a, almost like a straight path between everything that you, you have done, everything. <laughs> what I love, it's everything it's linked and connected and, uh, and everything it's logical. So it's, it's nice when you're able to create a, a path that way. Um, I would like to highlight so, so, some points in, in it, but before that, can you uh, explain a little bit more about what, did, what do you like about the, the fashion? What was kind of the earliest memory that kind of sparked that, uh, that passion for it? So uh, my earliest memory would be when my grandma was uh, like when I was younger and my grandma used to sew and like do crochet, tricot, all that. And uh, I remember she had some magazines and in one of those, like one of those Marie Claire or something, there was this story about uh, Gabrielle Chanel and I read it and I was like, well, that's nice, you know, like she had fancy clothing, like you're known for making clothing. And I was like seven or something. And I think that was the starting point, actually. It, it just felt so different from my world in Brazil, where, you know, just wear bikinis. And uh, from then on, I started looking a bit more online. It was the time when the internet was starting to boom. So uh, I remember w watching McQueen. And that was like my big fashion initiation was watching Alexander McQueen. And he was like an icon to me. Uh, I would get like anxious before his shows. and. Like I started like getting inside it. I remember that the first, uh, the first collection I was very much inside fashion. Like following everything was spring summer tw uh, twelve. Yeah, spring summer twelve was my first big collection. So from then on, I guess it's just been part of my life. And and focusing on on the McQueen collection, what what did you love uh, about him? Uh, I just love that everything was much more than just clothing. Like being a, a literally a child at the time, uh, I was used to like really what you wear every day. And then you had some Robin's paint, paint on Charlotte Harlow. And uh, that was just amazing. And everything had a story behind and so much drama behind. And they told so much about the designer. It just amazed me to like an insane point. So I always grew very fond of him, like remember when he died, how sad it was. Uh, but he was, I think he was my fashion initiation. He was the one who really made me think, me get into it. And when he was alive, it was just a big thing. Like before he did any shows, there was a commotion. Like I've never seen before when we talk about Balenciaga nowadays, but it's nothing even close to that. Like at the time we didn't have live shows. So people were just like, how do I know what has happened? And it took like one day for it to be on style.com. But still, uh, it was like, today is McQueen, you know, like fashion was tough because there was McQueen. So I think that kind of buzz we'll never have again, especially because we have like bloggers and internet and everything is so fast. And also because I don't know if we'll ever have a creative genius as McQueen was. But in any case, it was an interesting moment to grow from fashion, having like the biggest designer possibly ever. And uh, when the blogging, the blogs were starting, when internet was becoming a thing, like yeah, like Scott Schumann doing streetwear, uh, like street style, and uh, yeah, Raffinari 29, you know. So 
it was it was interesting to see fashion changing so much and i really got inside it awesome i love i love the the way you talk with such a uh, with such passion uh, about, <laughs> uh, about my queen because one of the thing um, i always uh, talk with my my clients or even with students it's the fashion industry it's a it's a industry of passionate people we all have some type of similar story something one show one designer one thing in our life that sparked that and from there uh, we love the storytelling i love the you use the word drama and it's true it's something uh, that it's a uh, encapsulate life in all his facets and of course it's ar around clothing and garment but at the end it's all the drama of life in one big in industry and i think that's why we we all connect in some way. It could be the music, it could be the models, the makeup, the everything. It's like a, a huge, you know, theater of, of life inside the, the fashion industry. So that's why we're all passionate about it. And it's a, it's one of the things that make our industry pretty unique and, and people want to work uh, in it. So so thank you a lot for, for sharing that, uh, that, that passion. And uh, um, just wanted to go back a little bit on on, on the, the let's say the, the past the, the trajectory. So you have that love for 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 passion. Um, how did you kind of uh, decided to incorporate that in your in your in your studies? Because you study uh, economics. What was the the idea of choosing uh, economics? And and at that time, did you did you know that you wanted kind of uh, try to work in fashion or not really? Or it came a little bit after. Um, I've always known I wanted to work in fashion, actually, but I didn't know in what. Uh, in the beginning, I thought a lot of maybe something more creative, even not like designing, but like working in styling, production. So that was very much in my mind. Before doing, uh, before going to university, I really didn't know what to do. Like I wanted to do something that would be useful for a future fashion career. But at the same time, like being in a third world country is a bit tough if you choose more creative careers. So I ended up choosing economics because it was a bit broad, just like business is. So, but well, I, I found economics more interesting than business. That's how I chose between the two. And uh, I know it wouldn't help at all for any styling thing in the future, but well, that was pretty much what I had to choose for. So I ended up choosing economics and I never really felt that it was my thing. Like I went for university, it was okay, but I never loved it. And then I had to start working. So I started working in finance and I can see how much it has taught me in terms of everything, in terms of like, from work ethics to uh, technical things, like everything that comes from analysis that I know today and that I use a lot in my job, I learned in finance, that's for sure. Everything regarding software is like Excel, VBA, Power BI, I learned in finance. And finance is like an express course of pretty much everything because investment banking is uh, a pretty intense career, but you learn a lot, a lot, really. So. And yeah, I was just trying to see how I could relate that to fashion. And a bit before starting work, actually, I came to Europe to do a very short course in fashion. Uh, it was by the end of my economic studies to see if I really still wanted that or if it was just something I dreamed about when I was a kid and then I eventually would give up. And yeah, I still wanted that. I absolutely loved everything I learned. And that's when I actually learned about the different fashion careers inside fashion. And uh, I guess kind of the glamour of styling and uh, it just faded out. And I've seen that there's much more inside of fashion than just that. And uh, I still find it super interesting, of course, like we had styling classes at EFM and I absolutely loved it. But I saw it was not me anymore. Like I've grown to be a person of the numbers after so many years doing that. And uh, it was nice to see that numbers and fashion can relate. So when uh, I came back to my hometown in Brazil, I knew that I wanted to go on with that, to pursue a career in merchandising or something more analytical inside fashion. And uh, but the pandemic came, started working in Brazil and everything. But when I finally had the time, uh, that was nice to come to Paris, also being sure of what I wanted in the end. Uh, coming to EFM uh, 
I mean, I was not set in stone that I would work in March, but I knew it was a possible career. I did not arrive. Like, what do I do after this? So it was also nice to have my whole master kind of focused in that. So when we had merchandising classes, I would have more more precise questions, for example, should the merchandising teachers and uh, everything. So it was a pretty bumpy <laughs> decision, uh, bumpy road. But uh, in the end, I think it all made sense. Uh, I changed a lot through from the choices I've made in Brazil a lot due to external conditions. But it all made sense. I love I love the the way you you talk about your story and just the the word you you just said like uh, it, it was bumpy, but mm -hmm. it all makes sense. Because at least I think that's what encapsulates uh, uh, a lot when it's a, a, a fashion uh, trajectory or, or at least a career, a career uh, in general, is that it's never a straight line. And I think that early in our, our careers or during our studies, we imagine that everything's going to make sense, going to be logical, that each step lead to the next one in a perfect order, and we're never going to be anxious, or, and we're always going to have certainty. And uh, and I like that the, the by what you what you explain and illustrate it's the reality it's always different. Okay, you discover that you love fashion, but you discover that you have an analytic kind of mindset and you're good with number and you appreciate it in uh, in in some way. But what you want is to put that that, that analytical mind at the service uh, of the fashion. And so, how can you do that? Especially come as you say coming from. Brazil, when you don't have, you're not in a European capital, so you don't have all the knowledge, contact, and don't know everything. So I, I like that uh, you express that you went to Europe, had a, a class to kind of open up. So you see, you had you were brave too, and had the, the means to to be able to do that, and, and and put you in another environment and face in a way that uncertainty to accept that okay, I don't know. Let's go have a look and discover and and, and learn see. Or we can co co combine that and uh, that's why that's something I, I want to highlight that it's really important because it's true at the level where you are now and it's going to be true for the rest of your your career there is moment and uh, we're going to talk about it a little bit later that we don't know exactly what is the right path uh, and uh, it's it continue like that all along our, our, our career and uh, i think what uh, also something uh, yeah, if there's ahead. something I can I can say to people who have been in my situation is that yeah. yeah, life changes. So I remember when I was starting in university and uh it was not what I wanted to do. I was like economics, you know. Uh and I was so sad because I really wanted to study abroad and just study fashion abroad. And my parents mm -hmm. said, No, you're a child, you're like 17, you're not moving to Europe on your own. So I was super sad. I was like, I'm never going to be happy with this economics thing, you know, like studying macro and micro. But in the end, it all worked out. So it's much more about how to make what you have make sense than having the right path from the beginning. Because if I had started in the university or studying fashion, I wouldn't have been where I am today. Like, I think I would have never considered doing merch, which is something I really like. And uh, it's something that opens a lot of doors. And it's something that I know I can do because I've had such a bumpy road behind me because finance has taught me so much. And now it works. So yeah, don't lose hope <laughs> if you're in that very same situation. My tip is don't lose hope because things kind of work out in the end. It's just a matter of like adjusting them and making them make sense. Is it, yeah, it's, it's exactly that. It's a... Uh... What is what I call, what are the supportive elements in your life, your studies, your skills, your background, that you're going to be to leverage to go where you want to uh, to be. In this case, how do I work in fashion? And as you explained, there is not one way to work in fashion. You don't need to start in a fashion school. You can start with economics, because those are going to give you uh, the skills uh, that the, the market needs. and. Um, and that's why I wanted to uh, go a little bit further in your finance, uh, you know, e experience, because you were saying that finance it's an intensive uh, environment, 
and a really fast uh, paced environment. So there is similarities with, with the fashion. And at the same time, you say it's so, so some type of crash course for everything in terms of tools, excels, and uh, analyzes. So can you tell me a little bit more about, uh, about that, how that two years experience in investment banking has been uh, something that you have been to leverage uh, today in your, in your job or even the way you, you work in fashion? Yeah, of course. Uh, so working in investment banking, as I said, is intense. Uh, the hours are absolutely crazy, much crazier than anything you will ever encounter in fashion, even though fashion is known to be tough. Uh, but that gives you a lot of endurance, for sure it does. Uh, like living work uh, at 10 p.m. in the showroom is chill, you know, because in the end, like you're surrounded by beautiful stuff and you're so happy to have the clothes all around you. You're like, it's fine, I can stay here until 10 p.m. Like two years ago, I was until 2 a.m. surrounded by numbers, so why not? And uh, yeah, but you learn a lot from everything because the pace is so, so fast. You have to do so many things at the same time. And uh, you, you learn a lot about multitasking, of course, about assigning responsibilities. Of course, when you're working in finance, you deal with huge numbers that you will never see in fashion, especially if you work, of course, in a more product-related area. So that kind of responsibility at a very early stage makes you rethink a lot what your work represents to the company and to yourself like any small mistake is a big thing so of course you become much more detail oriented you become much more focused on what you're doing and it comes naturally and in the end you just transpose that to any industry you're in including fashion so besides that everything that's regarding uh softwares like excel that i really learned how to use excel and finance so it was my everyday thing. And now that I, I applied for my first internship, I just said, well, I, I used to work in finance before and I never had to do any Excel tests because it just gives you the credibility. And once you're there, oh, of course, it really helps. Like uh, fashion is an industry like any other. You can do things by hand or you can create a macro on VBA and let the computer do stuff for you sometimes. So if you do the second, you have more time to do other things, to learn other things, uh, to be more in contact with other people, with product, you know, and et cetera. And so I think that passing on that knowledge to the fashion industry was quite helpful as well, because uh, not having to struggle with some things gave me some more time to do things that are not technically like intern job. And yeah, so finance is, is intense, but you learn a lot. That's what I would say. Uh, even if the work has absolutely nothing to do, like at first I worked with equities, no, with futures and then with equities and then with bonds. So uh, I did the operation for the trading desk for that. And yeah, it has absolutely nothing to do with my job today. Like don't see anything regarding stock market or anything in fashion, of course. But uh, you learn a lot of soft skills and hard skills when it comes to softwares and etc that are very much transposable. Great. Uh, I, I love it. It give a, I imagine it gives a lot of uh, hope for people who say, OK, I'm in a finance major or I'm going to I did my internship in in finance, but my dream is to work in, in, in fashion and like that. It gives them a framework to think about it and to say, OK, how can I leverage that uh, to, to, to get where, where I want to go? And um, if you if you had to give a, maybe a few um, advice or, or recommendation for people who are not in finance or don't have that analytical mindset, but still want to kind of uh, acquire those uh, soft skills that you were talking about. What would what you recommend them to start doing from now? Say you, you talk about being focus uh, oriented, uh, you know, more focus or, or, or oriented. Is there, what would you, what you recommend to them that to, to, to work on from before, before they enter in the fashion industry? Um, I think that if you want to work in an analytical role in the fashion industry, first of all, you need to know how to use Excel. Uh, <laughs> it's super standard, but it is indeed what we use 24-7. And uh, it's not only about that. And that's what I really like about my job. Like, all the analysis is there as a support. So you have to know product. You, you really have to know brand and identity and positioning and everything as well. Uh, but for sure, yeah, knowing Excel, but in working on 
everything that's analysis that you can get on like business of fashion, you know, like maybe you're not gonna have a big database where you make a graphic and take a conclusion, but read the news, know what's going on with the world, like read the numbers from LVMH, from Karen, from Hishmo, uh, try to understand what it means and try to translate it into reality, you know, like if everyone says that the US is growing, which, which, which groups are growing in the US, if you can see by company inside the groups, which ones are growing in the US, what does it tell you about the market? Because in the end, it's not just about the numbers, it's about the conclusion you take from the numbers and from the product. And it all, you get everything and all together and you see if it works for a market or not. Now I'm currently working in uh, central merchandising. So we see the whole word at once and we see the different nuances from every region. And that is also very important to know from news, from reports and everything. If you get like uh, Southeast Asia, recently on Business of Fashion, that was this great uh, text about how they've been growing recently. Does that apply to all brands? What kind of style is more favorite in those brands, you know, in those countries, etc. So it's a big uh, analytical thing, but very, very related to fashion. So working on the, the hard skills like Excel for sure, like maybe Power BI, something that allows you to use the databases, but much more beyond that. It's useful to, oh, there's a nice. Uh, it's useful to know how, how where to come from when you analyze something. Yeah, uh, it's super super interesting, and in, uh, I like that you you talk about the the, the news. And the fact that the numbers are, are there to support uh, like real decisions and uh, what matters is like okay what insight can you get from from those uh, those numbers and from those insights what recommendation or what move sh should be done because that's also like the the reality you you need to be able like to do something with those those insights and uh, i think we we never like uh, uh you know highlight enough the importance to start early following the industry's uh, news. Uh, even at, at the beginning, we don't understand everything. It's like through time, slowly and slowly, we start like making connections, seeing like the different things, connecting with something that we heard in a, somewhere else. And a year later, we say, ah, yeah, it's true. I remember about that. And from that, like you start building in a kind of your expertise, your knowledge. And those are interesting insights that you're going to be able to bring to a company or during an, an interview, uh, especially when you say, you know, the brand the identity, you're going to be able like to really sound like at least more like an expert on, on the topic. Uh, and when you add that, that knowledge of uh, the news and the environment with technical and analytical skills, it gives you uh, that overall like view uh, that it's perfect for to work in a in a company and that's what they they're kind of looking for when they hire intern or junior it's like the person that it's well rounded that's going to be able to see the industry know how to use the numbers and at the same time understand the product the identity and the storytelling of a brand and uh, and it create that overall like arc or because to become a what we call a fashion uh, professional it's um it, it is a, a really, really interesting journey that, uh, that you had so far. And um, so, so can you t tell us a little bit more about uh, your position uh, uh, today? What, 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 uh, what exactly what you do at, uh, at Celine and what have you learned so far? What, uh, what was the kind of the, you know, the, the, the novelties that kind of you discover compared to, to finance or what the expectation you have and what is the, the reality? How, how is it over there? Of course. Uh, so I'm currently working in Retail Merge Central for Women's Silhouette. That is women wear it, wear and shoes. Uh, and at Celine, of course. And uh, being central is slightly different from being in a zone. But I work on mainly three missions. Uh, the first one of them is everything regarding analysis. So we do analysis every week about the most important KPI, all the most important KPIs and, and key moments of the collections as well. 
uh, we pass on this analysis to the other team. So it's from that that we talk to the zones and we define strategies that we talk to collection merge and we define strategies for the next collections. And of course, analysis always comes on demand as well. At times you have to do some presentations, you have to respond something to your manager and uh, then you do analysis, what we call ad hoc. So it's a very essential part of everything. And it's very important to know all the main KPIs and the things that are useful for you and how to deal with them. Uh, the second part is everything that is regarding reassortment and uh, transferring because we need to optimize our sell through, our stock, our offer in the different zones. And Ben Central will have a vision of it worldwide. And so it's up to us also to be in contact with the zone and to define the best reassortment strategies uh, to answer VIC requests because sometimes VIC is with something that is not available in the report of the board. And uh, we also take care of that. Also, the more uh, decision part, of course, it's up to supply to do really the reassortment, but we do the decision part. And finally, I assist in everything that's buying session. So we have a buying session for every collection, as you can imagine. And uh, it's up to the central team to do uh, some reporting and to assist, it's up to me to assist in the production of everything that is organization and reporting of the buying. And being central, we do the first editing with share buying guidelines to the zones. And then we have the feedbacks with the zones, which is super interesting because you get to see the different nuances of the different parts of the board. And that is probably what I would highlight as most interesting in working in central. When you had every, any strategic meeting, when we had any result meeting or any like even buying guidelines, you got to know so much about small things from other parts of the world that you have never imagined. Like this very specific piece doesn't work in China because of the color and the shape of the sleeves, you know, and it's so micro at times, but it's so interesting if you like anything that's like trend forecasting and et cetera. Uh, so it's, it's a very nice position because it gives you a lot of vision worldwide. It gives you a lot of vision of the business as a whole of the company. Since you see all the zone, you can actually compare the markets. You can uh, compare what's being done in each of them, what works, what doesn't. And, uh, at the same time, you can go to a more zone level and talk to the zone managers and go to the stores and, uh, see things more microwave. So it's very nice to combine both micro and macro vision. Uh, what I would just say regarding retail merge is like when you go to your university or your master's and everything's like, oh no, but retail merge is so much numbers. Like those are usually people that have never seen numbers before and they get scared because I was scared in the beginning. I knew I wanted to do retail merge, but I was like, am I just living in finance to do something like, I just see numbers again, you know, maybe I should not, maybe I should go to something like collection merge where I can actually see fashion more, but like, it's not, the numbers are there to support you, but they're not the key thing. The product is the key thing. Like everything you do is regarding the product and the numbers they show you because you cannot just say, oh yeah, this is very good. Like you have to see if it sells to see if it's good or not. And you have to check your average price. Uh, you have to check in between the regions, how it's doing and everything. So you sell through, but it's not a, a thing about numbers purely and analysis purely They're there to help you. That's why I always say it's really much about the product. It's about going to the buying session and doing your strategy based on what you've had before, but especially for every where it just changes so much. You know, you don't have lines, you don't have functions. So uh it's really about believing in the product you were singing and uh investing on what you believe in and showing that to the zones and uh, selling the things you believe in and afterwards seeing the results of that so if you think about retail merge uh but you were scared of being too much number as i did like it's really not the case it's just a support but uh, the career is much more than that. And what I can say is that like it's super interesting. I have never been in a zone to experience something different, but being central, I can really assure you it's super interested. If you're interested in anything regarding uh, the different 
zones in the world, uh, how it is, how fashion is worldwide, uh, really the, the subtle differences between them, but also with a more practical part, I think it's a perfect year. Awesome. Thank you for this uh, complete description of the job. I, I love it. I'm sure like the people who are going to listen to us going to have like the overview and you know, probably have a bunch of questions. It's awesome. I like the way you you explain everything between okay. central, the zones, um, how the, you know, uh, analyzes numbers are the support of the product for one detail in one area of the world can have the impact on the rest of the the collection or at least the production or about the how you craft the best assortment according to the needs of the the, the the different markets and how all of that uh, you need to be able like to jungle those criteria and information so it's not only about the numbers it's also about understanding the customers and uh, and, uh, and and the different type of markets um, um just to follow up uh, a little bit on, on that what is the relationship you have with uh, the retail, with the salesperson? Because uh, we all know that you know fashion. It's uh, uh, at the end, it's really important in terms of uh, retail and uh, retail footprint. And uh, in your position, what are the relations you have with them? And uh, how how important is it to have a, a retail experience to work in fashion? So I've never had a retail experience before. And uh, so I, I cannot really much tell how important it is. But doing Central now, I am a bit far away from retail. I, I see that like we're not in a zone, so we don't really know the salespeople. We don't really know the store managers, uh, except if we go there, which is, of course, it makes sense in Europe. We can go to Mountain, to the Bumashin, et cetera, but I cannot go to SKP in China. So those I really don't know. Uh, but they are definitely a pillar for us. And that's all. That's why all the big brands and all the big groups have so much training on salespeople because they are the ones who sell. Like You can have the most awesome product, but if you don't know how to sell it, it won't sell. Because fashion is a lot about storytelling, especially if you're in a house like Sanin, where you have a Disney man who is basically an artist as a creative director. So you really need someone to tell the story and to show the client why something that is sometimes too fashion forward can be used in a day-to-day -day life and how some styling that may look a bit weird at first is actually the coolest way to wear it. So of course, in some brands, you have more fashion forward clients, but in some others, you also have to adapt to the commerciality but it's nice to see the mix of those in the big brands. And uh, the salespeople are there to do it. So the training is very intense and they really know a lot about the brand, about the collection and about selling what we have. So it's the, the thing that might be a pity in working in Centro is that you don't have that much contact with the stores unless, of course, you are with the zone. Uh, when we are with Europe, we can go to all the stores around Paris, we can meet the people, and it's so nice to see uh, what they say, because every store is so different, and they have such different clients and public coming in, and uh, it's very nice to be able to adapt the strategies for them. Uh, of course, it's up to the zones to do it, but we can participate until some extent. They invite us to the stores, we learn about that, and we sit down with them to to think of different things to be done. But uh, even though I'm kind of far from that, it's nice when we have the opportunity because working in retail, you really realize how the the retail part is, is essential for the fashion industry to run. So even though I never worked in retail before, I think it could be an, an interesting experience because it's like learning in practice and you are for sure going to use whatever you learn. Thanks, yeah, it's a... Uh... It's true. It's, it's super important. And that's why I asked you the question, because uh, what you were saying that you didn't have that retail experience. And, uh, and I wanted to, to see like uh, exactly how you, how you manage to, to work without that experience. And I like that you said that, yeah, it's, if you have the opportunity uh, to do it, because you will learn how everything works uh, over there, because at the end of the day, that's where everything happened. The transaction happened over there. The storytelling happened over there. And, uh, but it's also to highlight the fact that it's okay if you haven't worked in, in retail, you're able to find your, your path 
and you can work along the, along the way. What is really key, and according to what you said, it's at least go to stores, go to yeah. shops, like look at it, look how the people like have experience in the store, even as a customer, just browsing, understanding, analyzing. Yeah, uh, I couldn't hear the last part of what you said, the sound stopped. No, I was just saying that it's important to to go to the stores and, uh, and yeah. uh, even as a customer to experience that and kind of make connection just to understand how things happen in the store because uh, this is the heart of the, the, the business. Yes, of course. And if you have the chance, like if you live in Paris or something, just go to Montagne and uh, see how each store is different. Like if you go to Chanel, you are going to have a sales assistant to you. If you go to Saint Laurent, the sales assistant will probably not look at you. So uh, it's nice to see how it also shows the guidelines of the business and of the brand and try to relate that even to the aesthetic part. So yes, if you live in a city where you have the chance to have all the big stores, go, because it's super interesting. Also to see product assortment. Uh, of course, stores are divided into clusters. So how does it change the assortment from like a small store to a flagship? You know, that is also essential in retail. How does the behavior of the salespeople change in one store to the other? Uh, and this is an exercise you can do not working in fashion and not even working in retail, just pretending to be a customer and yeah. going everywhere. Exactly. I love it. It's a, that's going to be one of the call to action for the people listening. Mm -hmm. Go to the stores, analyze it, go to flagships versus small stores versus department store and, and try to draw some uh, insight from that that could be useful for you and if you want to work in fashion. So thanks a lot for, for that, Isabella. And um, and what about now? Well, so how long um, do you have to you still have on your internship in uh, in Celine? And uh, what are your thoughts or interrogation for for your future? So uh, I think at Celine in December. I started in June. It's a six months internship. So I'm finishing this December. Uh, and uh, for the future, I wonder, like, since I'm not French anyway, I came to Paris to try a new experience. I wonder whether it's nice for the career, especially at the very beginning of the career, as I am now, to move to another fashion capital. Because we know that all fashion capitals are so different, uh, one from the other. And uh I don't know if that kind of experience would be, I mean, for sure the experience will be fulfilling and will bring me a lot and to anyone a lot. But at this stage of the career, do you think it's worth it? Do you think uh, we should uh, continue working in Paris since uh, Paris is the big fashion capital, it's where you have to do and everything, it's the biggest fashion week? Or do you think uh, it's worth trying something new and going abroad, etc. And if so, if going abroad is something that seems interesting, how are the processes in general? Like I know about the VIE, but how does exactly it work? It's a perfect, a, a, a lot of questions. Before we try to, yeah. to, to dig into uh, each of them, my question for you is like, at the moment, what are your your thought process to kind of sort it out. What criteria are you using uh, to kind of decide? Okay, stay in Paris, go to uh, to another capital of uh, you know fashion capital. Uh, should I do it this day at this stage of my career or a bit later? What are the the criteria and the thought process and kind of the early analysis that you have for now? Uh, I am very career focused. I can say, and I really want to do the best that the best for my career at this point. Like I really like yeah. what I do and I want to grow inside of what I do. I want to like one day be a manager and everything. So I want to go in the right path for it to happen. I want to find a job that gives me a certain degree of autonomy. Like I'm very happy with my team at Celine and I'm very happy that they give me a lot more of autonomy than an intern would normally have. Like I can actually do things that are not just intern job, you know, like doing the the operational job so i can participate in like quantity estimations everything that's strategy and that's amazing and i want to continue having that even in a junior position so this is something that is has a, a very strong wave in uh, anything that i'm looking for at the moment 
and also because I believe that's the best way to develop yourself and like grow further in the career. So this will be my main focus is having, of course, a job aligned, but a position that allows me to do interesting things and not just operational stuff, even though it's a junior, and to be in an environment where my career can actually be boosted. Okay, so if I, uh, I try to summarize what you said and to highlight so, so keywords, so if I want to say the number one criteria, it's you career driven and you say, okay, I want to, the next move has to help me to uh, have the best, you said, the best career possible. So that's kind of uh, the, one of the criteria, and we're going to go back a little bit on it, but just for the moment, uh, okay, career driven. Number two, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, you say uh, autonomy, you know, because, you know, you have been able to work more as a junior and less as an intern. So you want the next move to uh, for you to give you certain type of autonomy and responsibility and uh, uh, and at the same time growth like that uh, learning e experience so that's one of the the criteria so let's say the experience and the growth and the autonomy and number and number and number three um i would say like uh, one of the questions is like is that better to do that uh, staying in paris because it's the capital the fashion capital of the world or uh, is that interesting to uh, go to another capital, another country to experience that? Uh, do you do, do you agree with kind of those three buckets? At, yes, the... yes, yes, yes. Perfect. So let's go to bucket number one. Uh, what do you what 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 would be like uh, your definition to have a good career? Uh, I would say that working in something I like, like going to work happy and having missions that are interesting to me but at the same time where i see i'm learning uh, i'm not just stuck in the same position uh, i wouldn't say like learn something new every day because i think it's a bit too much but uh, where i'm constantly learning something new i'm constantly uh, in contact with people that bring me new stuff that bring me new ways of thinking of looking at things and uh yeah and uh, seeing a future you know like not being stuck in a position that i know i'm never gonna have like a promotion or anything being mm -hmm. somewhere that i know is like a booming company where new positions are going to be open where the team will be rotating and where i'll have an opportunity to grow in the future okay very well so if we go to bucket number two uh, it was about learning, discovering, responsibility. So if I listen to uh, your definition of a good career, we, we might say that it's kind of one in, one unique bucket. So a good career, it's a career that gives you freedom, opportunity to grow in an environment uh, that have a, it's a clear path in terms of growth, in terms of uh, opportunities for the next stage of your career. So let's, uh, if you, is that okay with you? Let's yes. summarize that in one big bucket. So now we have we, we have a clear understanding, uh, at least some criteria to think about what is a good career and uh, uh, for you. So now let's go to bucket number three. Uh, so uh, you say you, you have uh, opportunities to go to another capital of the world. What is the do you have already a capital in, in mind? Do you have a, a specific opportunities in, in mind or is that just a hypothetical? Uh, I'm currently thinking about New York City. OK, perfect. And um, is there like a, a, spe a specific position there that you, you, you imagine to have or, uh, or is that like a, you want to go to, to New York uh, and explore what, what's, what's over there? Uh, yeah, I would like to continue working in merchandising, of course, like retail merch. Okay. Going to the U.S. is uh, in a zone because okay. while well, you don't have like the big companies, they're not in the U.S., so you have central teams there. So it will change a bit what I do nowadays, but I, I love the work in zone so i think i would love it as well uh but my doubt is really about like city since it's not like a pulsing fashion city but it's still a big financial center like it's literally like the center of pretty much everything in the world so mm -hmm. for fashion uh is it the same thing or is it like uh always much much smaller uh do you still have the context with the fashion industry which is something so important etc okay so again let's let's summarize a little bit so uh if you go to uh, let's say new york you will have you will be able to work still in the same type of uh, let's say uh, position but your scope will be uh, to the to the zone so a little bit more, more more different and if you stay in paris you will stay in central or at least try to stay in central to have that big vision of the entire market and 
and so on. You, so that's the first two things that I, I, I kind of highlight. And number two, it is, okay, which capital of the world, it's the, well, which fashion capital, it's more interesting in terms of connection, in terms of market and, yeah. and, and things like that. Okay. Um, there is, we can go in, in different ways uh, to try to, to, to narrow down to, to something. Um, I would like just to uh, highlight in terms of positions, uh, zone versus central. Coming back to the criteria number one, the growth, the environment, uh, if you have to analyze it through that scope, do you think you will have a good career staying central? Or, and do you think you, you would like, you will have a good career staying in, a, in a new, let's say New York in the zone, according to what you decided are the criteria of a good career? I think both. Uh, I think both would uh, allow me to have uh, a good career. So you, you, you would say that either path are equally in terms of uh, learning environment and growth, they kind of equals for you. You will be happy with both in terms of uh, on that criteria. Yes. Okay, perfect. So let's say those are, are kind of equal. Uh, so now cities versus uh, cities. So Paris versus uh, New York. Uh, what what are the criteria? What do you think Paris has and uh, that kind of advantages for for you that you think are, are good to stay here and. What are the good things that you, you, you think that New York ha has? Um, so I think that the main thing about Paris is that we have EFM. Uh, coming from EFM, we have a big alumni network that allows you to get in contact with pretty much anyone in the fashion industry. And that gives you so many nice opportunities. Like, I don't want to do any EFM propaganda, but it is indeed a game-changing thing. Uh, like last week, uh, we had a meeting with Sidney Toledano, uh, and a lot of alumni you got to talk to him directly, ask him questions. And that is something pretty unique that I would miss in Paris. Uh, besides that, you have all the headquarters in Paris, so pretty much everyone works here in fashion. Uh, I know some brands are in Italy, some brands are like all over the world, but the, the real big thing is here. So I think that's something that counts a lot for Paris. And also like everything that's regarding the fashion scene. If you live in Paris, you know, the city booms when it's fashion week and uh, like the people in the street are different and everything. So that that's a really big question for here. Uh, but at the same time, I think that the US is a booming market and uh, it has not exported its full potential yet. Uh, that's what not only I, Isabella, think, but a lot of experts as well. It's what Toledano said last week. Uh, it's what we see in business of fashion. So I think it can become something bigger. New York is usually known for uh, emerging designers, much more than the huge ones as we have like in Paris. But at the same time, it is a booming market. So you can change like a lot of locations. Uh, we see some cities like Houston, like Austin, growing so much and becoming as well fashion capital. So that's also a very nice opportunity to dig into a new market as uh, some people dig into China who now is like a huge, huge market. So I think that the, the opportunity part of the US is also very interesting, even though it's not as well established as a fashion capital, it can one day become a very big thing. Okay. So now that we have a, a more a, a, a clear vision of the advantages and let's say disadvantages. Um, I would like to take a, maybe a, uh, a step aside uh, and think about the, what is the cultural environment that you, you want to, to have, you know, Paris versus New York, European versus the Americas. Is that important to you in terms of environment, people, uh, connection, you know, like lifestyle? Is that a criteria for you? I think it's important to some extent, but it's not something I'm willing to let be a decision maker. Because oh. I mean, uh, with nowadays we're all kind of global citizens, you know, like, and I can mm -hmm. go to New York and stay 10 years and come back to Paris or to China or anything. So I think it's important to experience other countries and other cultures, other ambiance. Mm -hmm. And uh, even though it might not be your favorite, I mean, you're always going to learn something from it. I'm not at home anyway, so uh, nothing will ever feel like being home. So why not try different things? Yeah, 
exactly. No, it's, a, it's interesting. And I want to highlight something that you just said that uh, I can stay in New York 10 years and come back to Paris. So now what, I, what kind of a exercise I, I want us to, to, to do is like to, to have some life scenarios exercise. What would be your life if you stay in Paris and say uh, working in Central? How you imagine your life, the rest of your career, you know, the contacts that you have, you were talking about the IM contacts. How do you imagine your life staying here in terms of jobs, position, a growth? Yeah, uh, this is a tough question, actually, but it's I imagine it's something a bit like the continuation of what I do nowadays. Uh, like, I mean, it's a small city, so there's not much geographically you can go. So I imagine myself having a similar life to what I now have, which is great, by the way. Uh, going to like seeing my friends and going to everything that like EFM still allows us to have. And like uh, having like a Parisian lifestyle, you know, walking everywhere, going to work by food and everything. So this is indeed something nice. Uh, I don't know how it would be in a place like New York City. I mean, I've never lived there. I've been uh, traveling, but I don't know how it is to be a local in New York City and not just a tourist going to the museum. So this is this would be like really a shot in the dark, I would say. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but let's let's stay a little bit in, in just in Paris. So you say yeah, you can go by food, the contacts. In terms of uh, work, what, what do you imagine your work would be in uh, in five years, more or less, if you take this road of staying here and being in Central? Um, I think that if I stay here in five years, I'll probably be like a senior merchandiser. Mm -hmm. I think it's a good uh, amount of time for you to become a senior. So like still more or less the same overall job, but more responsibility and uh, more senior missions. Okay. Reporting to like higher people and the brands are hierarchy, etc. So maybe more management as well, uh, a bigger vision and things like that. Okay. So now let's let's do the same exercise with New York. So how do you imagine your life? So you said like yeah, you haven't lived there, but you imagine, but just stay in the let's say in the focus of the the job because we don't know the how to live uh, is the life there. But in terms of jobs, so you're working in the zone. Uh, you said like in the next five years, you know more or less what is the job. How you imagine the, your life will be over there if you stay two or five years, two between two and five years. Uh, I think career progression would be pretty similar. Actually, I would see myself in a senior position. Uh, also responding to higher people and uh, doing more higher like, jobs, like having uh, more responsible missions and uh, working more in uh, strategy. You will be working more in, a, in, in more in the strategy in the, in the US? No, I think both will be the yeah. same, like as in a senior yeah. position, working for more strategy both here and uh, in the US. I think career path. Uh, the main difference is indeed on the missions if you work on Central and if you work on a zone. So you can actually like you go more to the stores, uh, you know the salespeople by name uh, and everything. But in terms of career progression, I think it will be pretty similar. Okay. And if we stay in the, in the missions, um, would you say in terms of learning curve, learning, uh, you know, growth, um, where you will grow the most in Central when you have the vision of the world or in the US when you said earlier that it's one of the growing markets that you know everything is happening over there new cities new stores which one would be the the one you will learn the, the most I think maybe in the US since it is indeed a booming market and uh, yeah things are changing so you always learn more when things are changing and you have to quickly adapt so I think this will be a huge learning experience. Okay, so uh, if I take your, your what what you're saying, in an environment that it's changing, there is a, a bigger growth curve that could appear. Uh, while in Paris, you still see that growth curve, like uh, happening, but you're not as involved and you don't have the same impact. If I understand well, but you still yeah. see it. Oh, okay, so let's stay in the in the in the U.S. with that uh, that growth. Uh, I'm taking that in consideration. You talked earlier about Paris and the uh, network 
and uh, you know you have that network. Um, do you think in the US uh, you, you you will also have a, a, ne a network when you project yourself over there? Uh, this is something I actually have no idea. Like okay. uh, I know that the market is reasonable in New York City, but I don't know how big it is in terms of like literal people. And uh, here it's very easy to have a network because of EFM, not just mm -hmm. because of people I know. And uh, they are, I don't know how to meet people as in here we have EFM. Okay. So perfect. So I think we have a, a big a, a big overview on, uh, on, on, a, on a lot of things. Um, I'm going to give you, I hope this all of this exercise has, has helped you a little bit more uh, to think about it. I don't know. Is there like, a, do you feel like it's you're able to see a little bit better, or not really yes. for the moment? Yeah, I think so. Yes. Okay. Uh, just for the exercise sake, if you had to choose now after the session, what what would you choose? Uh, I would go to New York. <laughs> Uh, I was really when you talked about uh, where do you think uh, you can grow more and I mentioned all the change and how we can be a new opportunity for growth. Uh, I don't think I had, uh, I mean, I had an idea that like New York has the booming city, like the American dream, everything, you know, but uh, I hadn't really stopped to think that uh, this can apply to myself, you know, like even if I don't have like the American dream going to New York from I don't know where uh it's still as a place of growth so that can be applied to my industry as well exactly i'm i'm glad you you arrived to that conclusion because uh, uh like uh now i changed kind of my my heart more like as a fashion professional and uh, if i had to give you uh, uh my point of view according to what you told me i would have said uh, i recommend new york as well and not because Paris is uh, less good than New York, but because of the criteria you used at the beginning. You say growth and opportunities is the number one criteria. And following that, I agree, I arrived to the same conclusion than you, that it seems that it will be an environment that it's going to grow more in terms of business and it grow more for you in terms of uh, new opportunities and, uh, and responsibilities. And, um, and to uh, give you some insights about like the, also the networking part, I would I would recommend to you to uh, to contact the uh, alumni because you know the alumni they have hubs everywhere and there is a US and New York one. Uh, so my recommendation for you would be to talk to the alumni that work in New York, like that you can ask them all the questions about the life, about how is it, about the opportunities, uh, how they were able like maybe to from New York after work, uh, come back to Paris. And you see, try to find people who can uh, um, help you uh, validate your, 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 your intuition uh, and give you new insights that may be gonna uh, go towards the decision you are making or at the opposite say, ah, I didn't thought about that. It could be interesting to rethink everything, you know, give you new, new criteria. And, uh, and the, other, the other thing I would like to say in terms of networking, always think networking are also like, what are you bringing to the network? Uh, and so the place where you're going to grow the most in terms of responsibilities, in terms of, uh, you know, what type of, especially for analytical people, what type of revenue you have been able like to, to bring, what is the size of the market that you have been able to manage, that also gives you a lot of leverage in any networking situation. So. If for you the growth is important go to the place when one from here two three four five years you're going to be able to bring a lot of things on the table and be an interesting person to network with because people are going to want it to work with you because of everything that you have done so sometimes it's not so much where you can network the most is where you can grow the most to when you have enough experience you're going to be really interesting to network with uh, at that specific moment of your career Okay. That's uh that's really something I haven't thought of before. And uh yeah, it makes a lot of sense. So awesome. So go talk to the other IFM. Really, I advise you, yeah, to network a little bit and yeah, continue to use the, the, the same thought process that we want. What is the number one criteria? And then use the thought process to kind of imagine from there where you want to go, what it's important 
use the live scenario, you know, uh, uh, process like that. You can imagine how the life would be and how you imagine uh, working there. And even you don't arrive to a specific conclusion, at least it gives you uh, a way to analyze the situation and balance uh, everything. Yes, of course. It's it's great. It's great advice. Thank you. Perfect. Um, so just to, to wrap up uh, our, our conversation, Isabella, do you have um, anything that uh, you know you want to say to the next generation uh, coming, something that uh, you know we talked about, like they have read the news, but is there anything else that you, you want to share with them that they, they could look, have a look or you advise them to, to follow, anything that you, you want to share to, to wrap up? Uh, yeah, it's read the news for sure. Like read business of fashion if you're a student, it's for free. So read it, like read it every day, even the things that don't interest you that much. For example, I'm not that much into beauty, but like take five minutes off your day and read that thing. You know, like it's gonna be useful somehow, uh, and it's much nicer than reading the Financial Times. So go for it. Uh, it gives you a very good perspective of the market. Uh, of everything you will need to know. Uh, there's also the logic part when they talk about fashion shows. Watch all the fashion shows. Like the industry is about that in the end. Like you can be a business person working in fashion, but like you can also be a business person working in anything else. But so if you love fashion, love fashion for what it is, not just for the business part. Watch the shows, read the critics, read the good critics, because we have so much generic ones that just talk about the designer inspiration, but like you can see that on yourself. So read the people that actually know what they're talking, read Tim Blanks, uh, know what has been changing and how that reflects in the collections. Uh, besides that, like go to the stores, see everything with your own eyes, see how stores are different, how salespeople are different, how brands are different. And from that on, you will have your own critic opinion. You will know at which brand you will want to work at because this is also essential. Uh, you will know what you admire and uh, like see fashion as something you love, you know, like don't make fashion be an obligation. Fashion should be a pleasure. You should be happy to watch a show from your favorite designer. You know, it should make you emotional. You should cry at times. So don't let business uh, hide that part of fashion you know don't just make it your job keep it as the thing you love it's tough to work with something you love because people say work with something you love and you never love it again but it should not be like that you know like know how to separate some work stress and everything from the thing that makes you happy in the end of the day so keep being a fashion person even though you're in a more business job and like really enjoy because it's very nice to work in fashion so if you want to do it like go for it it's uh it's a different industry uh you might need some specific coaching because everything is just so different like an interview for a fashion company is so much different than if you interview at consulting but yeah if it's really what you want go for it don't be afraid to change your career path and uh invest in yourself so it, it really works out in the end I love it. Thanks a lot, uh, Isabella. Great, uh, great feedback and advice for the next gen and I hope they, they're going to follow it. And, um, and thank you again for, for your time. I hope we're going to be able to do a part two to see uh, what you gonna end up doing and, and, and see how, how, how everything is on, on, on your side. And, uh, and thank you yeah, again for your time and all the, the, the advice. You too, Lucas. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye bye, Isabella. Bye. -bye.